I have uh, two, two goals today. Uh, one is to talk about outcomes after a patient with cardiac arrest leaves the intensive care unit and what things we might expect of somebody who's recovering and having a good outcome. Um, often we're just happy that they wake up, but there's more to it. And the second is to use that to lead into how a, um, uh, we should think about clinical trials in critical care in general. Because I think, um, I think my presentation should have raised questions about whether the way we do clinical trials is uh, correct or not. So that's going to be a little more speculative. Uh, and I will, I will um, warn you that I don't have an answer for certain. I'm going to make a proposal of how we might do clinical trials in the future. So um, this is Pittsburgh. This is my university. And we're very close to Carnegie Mellon University small um, uh, opening uh, uh, rotunda on the left is Carnegie Mellon University and the large tower is University of Pittsburgh. And the two universities are intertwined, so our campuses uh, are, are next to each other and the buildings are mixed together. Um, it's a very good uh, collaboration. Those are my disclosures and that is the same uh, neighborhood. Um, my hospital is next to the white building. It's the one with the flag on the top. Um, here. Um, and uh, the buildings around it are the university. And we're very close to a large park, which you can see here um, in Pittsburgh. So that's Pittsburgh to give you a sense. The city is about the same size as Trieste in number of people. This is the chain of survival. It has been made popular by American Heart Association, European Resuscitation Council. It's used by the heart associations in many countries. And it has the traditional um, links, but the last one here is, um, is recovered. And that's what I want to talk about. You know cases that look like the clinical information. People have, it's time. People have collapsed. They need, they need CPR. Somebody uh, administers ACLS. Uh, in my country, it would be firefighters and paramedics. Um, and they get a, a pulse. In the emergency department, temperature management is initiated. The patient goes to cardiac angiography and has a stent. They have coma, but they awaken maybe after three days. And they have... Uh, some recovery in the hospital and they go home. That is um, really where I want you to focus today. All that other stuff is what you are doing uh, every day already. But what happens to this person as they go home? What are their experiences? It's common. We see many people who die acutely, but estimating in United States, um, maybe 70,000 people are going home and surviving after cardiac arrest. So what are the issues that they have to deal with? One of my partners led this writing group, and uh, this was published uh, just two years ago, three years ago now, uh, and it reviewed what we know about the recovery of people who've had a cardiac arrest. And it identified a number of um, areas where we should focus uh, because patients report having problems as they recover. Um, some, of the, some of the basis for this is grounded in the World Health Organization's um, description of how you describe recovery. And they talk about these domains, impairment, activity, and participation. So when you think about when somebody has critical illness, they survive the ICU, and now they go home, that leaves a scar. They are not just instantly back to normal. You know, this was a big event in their life. They have issues. Um, we can talk about them very medically by what are their impairments. And I like to use the analogy of a stroke. An impairment would be I cannot move my arm. This is an objective physical finding that you can test and do physical tests to say, I'm impaired, I have lost movement in my arm. An activity is what can I do? So 
Um, normally, I comb my hair with this on, but I have an impairment. That doesn't mean that I can't comb my hair because I can use my other arm to comb my hair. He looked at me and think maybe he doesn't comb his hair at all. I don't know. But maybe um, I can use my other arm. I can work around it. So I have an adaptation. Ah, but I go home and now I'm depressed. So even though I am able to comb my hair, I do not. So you see with the analogy of a stroke, um, when you separate impairments, activities, and participation, you know, do I actually do the things I'm capable of doing? Have I adapted to my impairment to do them in the impairment? Much too often, we only describe this. You know, and that's that's the medical approach where we really only think about impairments for um, for describing a patient's outcome. These things are modified by patient factors. So if I'm uh, very frail or I have other comorbidities, maybe I can't use my other arm, I'm very weak. Um, I may not be able to adapt to my impairments. And then maybe I have a bad situation at home and it makes me depressed or I don't have resources that I can use and those feed into it. So we need to um, consider all of those things when we talk about the survival of an illness. In medicine, um, you know, we have the immediate needs right in front of us, but we're supposed to be helping the patient as a person. So if they've gone through a critical illness and we're trying to help them as a person, we need to think about all these domains and all of these factors and what we can do or arrange for other people to do to help this person recover back to be um, the person they want to be. Okay, let's take some examples. Um, I showed you this before, the modified Rankin scale. It's a functional scale. It actually shows activities. What can I do? Um, and the pictures describe it. And there are definitions, and there's an instrument, and you can take a sheet, and you can ask questions and determine what the patient's score is. So if I can walk without a cane, I'm modified Rankin of two. But if I can walk by myself using some kind of assistive device, I'm modified Rankin of three. So it really describes my activities. It doesn't describe, oh, I'm paretic on one arm uh, and one leg. That's an impairment. It describes a function that I can do because I can have this impairment and still function in modified ranking of three. Get it? See how these things are interrelated? Doesn't mean that I walk when I go home because I might be depressed. Um, we usually talk about good outcome is being functional like that. And for cardiac arrest, this is what we move the literature towards is talking about good recovery uh, on a functional scale. And I will frequently see papers written where they talk about neurologic recovery. And they say the patient is neurologically normal. I don't know. Uh, there's neurologists in the room. Uh, we, we all are maybe not neurologically normal. If we test any of us, we may actually have some uh, um, impairments uh, in different neurological things. But really, you know, our function is what determines how we interact with the people around us. So these are, I think, better scales for assessing outcome after a critical illness than describing all the deficits. So when I see those papers and I get to edit them, I, I, make the, I make the authors change neurological recovery and say what they really mean, which is functional recovery. And functional recovery, remember, can be influenced by patient factors and things I can do to help the patient, even if they have some deficits neurologically from, the, from their injury. So there you go. Modified ranking is an activity functional status. It's there. Well, does it change after leaving the hospital? And again, I'm reviewing some data that I showed you before. Um, people change over time. So if you keep them in the intensive care unit for two weeks and then you send them to a, uh, another unit in the hospital or rehabilitation and they recover for another couple of weeks, um, they keep changing. So people who have um, modified random scores in the yeah, you see, um, uh, in the good zone, the lighter zone, people have better scores over at least the first three months and six months, maybe some change out to 12 months. So after cardiac arrest, people continue to improve for at least six months. 
This paper is now um, seven years old, but this was big news because for many decades, people said, oh, cardiac arrest, if I recover over the first week or two weeks, that's it. You know, and after a noxic brain injury, there's not much recovery after that. It's not true. This is more like traumatic brain injury where patients recover over many weeks and many months. Here's our Pittsburgh data showing the same thing. Um, just taking people that we contacted and where did they change from modified Rankin to modified Rankin to modified Rankin in three, six, and 12 months. And I zoomed in on a few of those, but you see a lot of people improve from hospital discharge to three months and from three months to six months and so forth. I'm here person showing you that sort of the mass of people is increasing uh, and improving in a lot of better ways. What kind of impairments do people have? So while I'm showing you their functional recovery, what, what kind of things are actually at play? Um, Kelly, in her paper, um, she reviewed what was known and what had been written about um, uh, uh, cardiac arrest patients. And I think that we all are really good at identifying physical ones. Uh, people have you know, uh, issues with the airway, vision problems. We also are good at identifying what neurological issues we have. Are they having seizures, myoclonus? Those are easily recognized when we see them in the hospital. But these ones in red are ones that we overlook a lot. And it's very easy to be in the hospital and nobody does a good test of your memory. It's also easy to be in the hospital and nobody explores whether you have anxiety or depression uh, or um, some of these other things. And frequently for cardiac arrest patients, the family has more uh, trauma than the patient. The patient was unconscious and now is waking up, but the family has gone through uh, not knowing if they would wake up or not and uh, thinking that they died and has um, had a great deal of um, uh, cognitive uh, insult linking them to trauma. So let's talk about assessing cognitive and psychosocial um, impairments. Simple thing, simple, simple thing is to do a test of cognition. And, you know, we think about neuropsychologists and maybe you've had to um, help with neuropsychology and you remember somebody came and they had all sorts of pens and papers and it took an hour and two hours and there was all sorts of testing. Um, you can do that. Um, you can also do this, which is um, available online, and it takes 10 or 15 minutes. Um, the more impaired people, the a bit more uh, difficult to um, finish quickly. And uh, you can be surprised that people who are talking to you and having a good conversation in the, in the, in the ward, when you actually test them, you find that they have terrible memory and that they can't draw, or they are having major issues with fluency. Um, patients adapt very quickly and fake you out. They trick you and, um, and make you think that they're doing really well, even when they have large impairments. And if you don't test for this, then you're not going to get them help for this. So I make sure that even when the patient looks like they're doing really well when we round on them and interview them, that we have this done formally. In my hospital, occupational therapy will do this um, if uh, the physician doesn't have time, but we usually do this ourselves. Executive function um, is, is one particular domain that's particularly affected in, uh, in these patients. Um, I, I'm an emergency physician. I don't really think I knew what executive function was uh, until um, you know my occupational therapist um, taught me about it. Um, it's really planning and sequencing um, and uh, being able to follow uh, rules and you change the rules in order to plan what you're going to do. Um, it's in the name. Um, sequencing, population, change the rules. This is a very uh, American centered test, but I can always do this by mouth and I can carry it in my pocket. 
So I just give people coins and I make them sort the coins. And I give them a point if they do it correctly. Uh, American coins have, have names that are a quarter dime, nickel, and penny, which I had them sort in alphabetical order. So I changed the rule and have them see if they can resort the coins. And uh, you will detect many impairments uh, in people as they recover. And if I test them on day seven, they can be quite impaired. And if I come back one week later, they are recovered a lot of the ability to do this. The entire time talking to me as if nothing was wrong. So it's an impairment that you can detect um, only if you test. And in fact, it's this time. When we do this test on our patients, we give different modified rankings. Look, those modified rankings of zero, one, and two, people who look good for walking around, 50% of them have memory deficits. 25% of them have executive function deficits. So it's a very common problem, even in patients who look like the type of recovery. So with that prevalence, you know, it, it, um, it, uh, it behooves us to test people while they're in the hospital. On top of it, they may have the physical impairments that you see. Uh, maybe they still have some uh, weakness. And what is this going to do for getting them back to working and taking care of their life? What's their participation? Well, their data on that as well. This is from the TTM2 trial. Um, our colleagues in uh, Sweden uh, interviewed people after cardiac arrest at 180 days, so six months after cardiac arrest. And you compared some people who had acute myocardial infarction. And the red shows people who have not gone back to work. Um, the, the light gray shows people who've gone back to work with limitations, or if they were retired and not working, have gone back to their normal activities or not. So as many as a third of people have not returned to their baseline activity at six months. Um, you know, and this is because maybe they have severe impairments, but also because they have these memory and um, uh, executive problems which interfere with them performing the job. Okay, well, maybe that's just bad news. Is there anything we can do about it? Um, the first thing, your decision, is when they leave the hospital, where do you send them? We've been talking about that uh, some of the patients that you guys have shared with me this, this month. And um, if the people are very impaired, modified ranking of five, you know, they may go to a nursing facility or um, in uh, these long-term acute care places for neurological impaired folks. Um, but you can see that as you get to these high ranking scores, better scores, zero, one, and two, people are usually going home in blue. And that means that if we're going to give them any therapy for the half of them that have memory problems, we need to do it as they're going home. The orange represents inpatient rehabilitation, which I learned here is um, uh, focused in a few places. As we mentioned, the facility in Moudine is, is a particular inpatient rehab and maybe a destination for folks. And I think you're more likely to think of that if someone's modified ranking three or four. Uh, and they are obviously impaired uh, when you first look at them. Uh, but the zero ones and twos may be people who need those deficits, and then um, you um, should consider that as well. So look, modified ranking of five, these are where most of them go, facilities. And many times we think those people aren't gonna recover. I've shared you some of this data before. Um, they're persistently comatose, minimally conscious, they have feeding tubes, uh, tracheostomy. Um, it's clear they need full-time nursing support. But I also showed you that 10% of them may recover over time. So as we send them to a long-term care or a nursing facility, it's very important to involve our rehabilitation specialists to set them up with things that will allow is 10% who are going to subsequently improve to do, to do so and to not suffer from being in that long-term facility. 
So if they're not moving, they need splints for their arms. They need splints for their legs. They need a plan of care for mobilization in keeping them from developing contractions. They need good uh, trait care. Um, maybe they need their medications adjusted in a way that normalizes the sleep-wake cycle. Um, all of these are considerations that um, you may not think about in an intensive care unit, but becomes very important as the patient transitions to a long-term setting. Mobilization, splints, feeding tubes, and trait care. Um, making specific recommendations individualized for that patient um, is good service um, if we make that transition. And remembering that that subset may recover while they're there. So if somebody starts to show improvement and no longer needs to be at that long-term care, who is going to assess them and maybe send them to rehabilitation? That's um, a logistical problem. Okay, let's take the other, the middle group. People who look like they've got some deficits, but they're awake. They go a variety of places. You can see that in my hospital, we like to send them to rehab. My goal is to eliminate skilled nursing facility and make everybody go to rehab. Um, inpatient rehab, um, I have issues because we have a private system and I have to document that the person is eligible for rehab um, in order for them to have insurance pay for rehab. So if they don't get approval from insurance, they have to go to a nursing home. And they get much less therapy at a nursing home than they will in patient rehab. Um, they have to participate for three hours, they have to have multiple domains, and they have to have rehabilitation potential. Um, there's good data that people improve while they're in rehab. So if we look at people when they go into rehab and when they come out, they look better. Maybe that's rehab, maybe that's time. So we should have control studies where we compare people who went to rehab and where they don't go to rehab. And for cardiac arrest, there are no data on that. So this is actually a big gap in the literature. And the insurance companies use this to say, there's no evidence that cardiac arrest patients have rehabilitation potential. So this is something I think is a high priority for research, something I'm working to try to gather data observational to compare, and for which I really, really wish there was a clinical trial where we could say, if you go to, if you send this person to rehab instead of to the nursing home, they will have a better outcome. I believe it, my rehab doctors believe it, um, but we need to prove it. Anybody going to do that study? Maybe thinking about it, it's a great thesis. Um, <clears throat> outpatient rehab is another option. So particularly these people who are modified rankings of three, um, they are two or three, and they um, have deficits, but they, they could go home. They could be left unattended. Um, most often they go home, but remember their memory is not right half the time. Their executive function is not right. They always talk about this person as being the most dangerous because their memory is bad, their executive function is bad, they go home, and they operate this, 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 the gas stove, right? You know, so they should not be operating, they should not be cooking, they should not get in the car and drive, but they look like they think, like, like they think. So, you know, what kind of services can we get for them? Outpatient rehabilitation has many flavors. Um, we have uh, cardiac rehabilitation, which I think is common everywhere. And uh, cardiac rehabilitation is usually improving your endurance. Um, you get on a bike, or you do uh, walking, you do supervising, you check your blood pressure, and it's, you know, it's really thought of as, as um, a uh, fitness type of rehab. But the people who do that and supervise that are the same people, the same therapists, who can help a patient with memory and do exercises and do adaptive strategies to help that person with their cognitive function but only if you ask them to do it. So my patients um, who have cardiac arrest, usually the troponin goes up a little. 
even if the cardiac arrest was from choking or something that's not cardiac, even the troponin goes up a little. In my system, if I document that this was a myocardial event, their insurance now is obliged to give them uh, cardiac rehab. And if I write on my request for cardiac rehab, also has memory problems, then the therapist, while they're exercising on the bike, will also talk with them about strategies for their memory and for their uh, mental recovery. So that needs to be something that we as doctors take responsibility for uh, recommending for the patient as they make these transitions. Um, and then the modified rankin zero and one, they're eager to get out of the hospital, they're eager to go home. Um, they also are the people who participate in surveys. So when you actually ask patients in survivor groups, well, how did you do when you recover? These are the people who say, who give us reports because they're verbal and they're, they're able to respond to surveys. Um, and people have collected data about what kind of advice they got as they went home. And you can see that uh, family in orange or the patient in blue report that about half the time, uh, somebody said you may have some cognitive problems. But they rarely got referrals for a psychologist or any kind of support group. Um, and they never got referrals, they rarely got referrals for a neurologist or a, uh, a brain injury specialist. We asked them, what do you think you should be getting? What would be helpful for you? Maybe that you did not get. Um, a psychologist was a high priority. So patients felt that they needed psychological counseling um, more than the kinds of referrals that they got. We're very good at giving discharge instructions that says you will follow up with your cardiologist in six weeks or three months. You're going to see um, the physical therapist, but um, less likely we send them for psychology. Um, in our Pittsburgh follow-up, um, where we said, you know, what kind of problems are you having? More than, more than half the people, as they just left the hospital, had negative mood, maybe a third of people after a month. Lots of anxiety, memory problems, and also notice chest pain. That's the CPR pain, broken ribs. Um, it's sad when you first go home, but a month later, it's mostly resolved. So that's actually a thing that you can treat and uh, give them some kind of uh, analgesic, kind of actually like the non steroidal appointments uh, for that very much. And the patients report stuff like this. I'm worried it's going to happen again. I'm worried it's going to happen again. What happens that, that it's a, a quote that recurs over and over and over. People develop existential anxiety. You know, they're now realize that they're mortal, they almost died, and they have to deal with that. This is pure psychology. Um, maybe this is the first major medical problem that this person has had, and it was a major critical illness. Um, I'm, not good. I'm not good at this, and I don't know that, you know, the patient actually realizes this when they're busy in the hospital. They realize this when they go home, sit down in their house, and reflect on what just happened. Um, so this is something that may actually hit them as they come home. These questions are frequently over, overlooked, and, um, you know, it's important that we give them precise instructions on this. You can see that the spouse or the family may actually um, be the most important person who's worried about these things and does not know. The patient with their memory problems is happy, happily uh, going home, assuming they're going back to do everything they're going to do. Um, the spouse in particular, um, I hear, is afraid to leave somebody alone. So um, a man's wife collapsed and now he's like afraid to ever let her out of his sight. Um, you know, and uh, that starts to irritate his wife who wants to be left alone sometimes, right? So it's uh, 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 an issue that needs to be discussed and, and worked through. Um, and the number one complaint 
more than anything else, is fatigue. Patients report, I am really, really tired. And I, I just get tired. I have to take a nap in the middle of the day. I do not have the energy I did before this event. We think it's um, probably multifactorial. One is your decondition if you're being in the ICU, but you also have impairments neurologically and you're trying to adapt to them. And you're probably working harder to do the same activities because of those impairments. So if the person is performing at a higher level, it's probably taking more cognitive load in order to accomplish the same tasks. Um, it also can be a symptom of depression. And uh, if it's not a symptom of depression, the fact that I don't have as much energy and I can't do as much as I did six weeks ago can make me depressed. One of my colleagues in occupational therapy experimented with an intervention and uh, he was conscious of the fact that not everybody could get to rehab, so he did a telephone intervention where he met with the person once and then he followed up with them by telephone every week and had them do a diary and then he came up with strategies and he found that over four weeks he could reduce people's symptoms of fatigue. And it wasn't rocket science, it was very simple things. He gave people um, a diary where they would write down what was hard to do, and then he would discuss strategies and make a strategy, have them do it, and see if it made the task easier. By ahead, pace yourself. You know, if you're going to do dishes, uh, get a stool and sit down while you do the dishes. Um, you know, again, this is not rocket science, but it's real medicine, and it, um, it's very difficult for um, uh, for us to uh, to do unless we uh, consider it and are aware of the problem. In general, critical illness leads to depression and anxiety. Um, this is a study. Um, authors are mostly in the UK, and uh, they um, looked at the incidence of uh, a scale having scores for anxiety, depression, and post-traumatic symptoms. Uh, and you can see that um, the green is good, the red is bad. 40%, 30%, 20% of patients after critical illness reported having depression, anxiety, or post-traumatic symptoms. And the anxiety has physical consequences. My colleague in New York um, found that patients who after cardiac arrest, reported high anxiety at a higher rate of major cardiac events over the year of recovery. And this was um, uh, you know, quite divergent between the groups. His idea is that anxiety is a constant um, sympathetic discharge and a constant source of cortisol, which can exacerbate some of the cardiac um, symptoms and uh, pathology issues we have. So hyperarousal can lead to major cardiac events. So look, we painted a picture. And uh, I'm coming back to Dr. Sawyer's model and the World Health Organization model. Our job in the hospital is to detect these impairments. Try to get the people with their activity to the right place and then consider about the things that we can do to increase their uh, activity and their participation if they make that transition. Anxiety, depression, post-traumatic symptoms really um, could benefit from psychology intervention or referral. Um, we can usually find a therapist near to the patient. And if the patient doesn't want to have any of that, there are toolkits that they can work on at home. Um, I use this one from the University of Alabama, which is designed for traumatic brain injury patients. It's got a lot of games and activities that a caregiver can do with a patient to stimulate their memory or to help them develop better skills for um, overcoming deficits. And some of my patients don't want to have a psychologist. And, uh, but they will do some of these home exercises with their family. 
There are three trials that do exist in this space. Um, I think it's all the trials in this space. Um, <clears throat> this one uh, looked at telephone follow-up of patients, and they just made uh, weekly telephone calls, um, and they taught patients about these problems after their cardiac arrest. And you found that this contact decreased anxiety and decreased the number of physical symptoms in the intervention group. So the investment was having a nurse call on the phone once a week after the patient was discharged for eight weeks. Not a big investment after you spent that much time on the critical illness. This one, um, again, is a nurse-led intervention. Um, it was in person. And he actually taught the person sort of mindfulness and relaxation exercises to help deal with anxiety. Um, and then it also bundled it with some health education and some cognitive strategies. And they found decreased depression symptoms. And interestingly, small study, but fewer people die in the group that got in the region uh, over the 24 months of follow up, two years of follow up. And then this one um, is. Again, a uh, consultation. Uh, somebody calls the patient um, and figures out what their needs are and then starts making referrals into systems based on what the person is doing when they get home. So I, I describe, you know, I'm a resuscitation, um, resuscitation physician. Um, in my original practice, I didn't do a lot of caring for the patient after they left the hospital. So the idea that this was my responsibility was a new concept for me. Um, but we have made it our practice that after we have been with somebody in the intensive care for that length of time, <clears throat> they go on our list and one of us calls them one week after they leave the hospital and find out what's going on. And sometimes we have to redirect and say, hmm, you know, you need to be seeing some person that you have not been referred to. And we make sure that we have these um, instructions and we make sure we have these referrals. <clears throat> we also um, have made sure that our colleagues in the hospital test for these problems. So if I'm helping a cardiologist for the person who has so many and a cardiac arrest and they recover and they're awake, but mostly the cardiologist patient, that I'm a consultant helping with that. Um, the cardiologist uh, very rarely does a mental status exam. And uh, you know, that becomes my responsibility to find out, you know, he has memory problems. He should get this in addition to his cardiac rehab. And then giving hope, you know, that this is going to get better. Is actually very beneficial to the to the, um, to the family. Um, when I have the patient and I demonstrate to the spouse, look, this man has memory. His memory is terrible. The spouse realizes his memory is terrible, and they're thinking this is going to be very difficult to take care of him at home. This person's going to be dependent. It's very encouraging when I can say, but this is going to get better over the next few months, and the more we work at it the more improvement, you know, we hope for. Um, that's a very different message than, oh, this person now has memory problems and you have to be sure. Um, and you know the interventions which I described. So that, that kind of, this is, this is the intermission part. This is the first part of my lecture. Outcomes. So I don't know, does this make you think differently at all about recovery from uh, critical illness? You know, that there's um, some things that we can do for the patients, identifying the patients, and then maybe some things in your practice that you can don't get yourself, make sure somebody does it for the person who's recovering from, from critical illness. Helpful, not helpful, not sure. Crazy. Anybody need a psychologist? <laughs> you have anxiety about what I'll do. We talked about we talked about how people are changing. All these things are at play. I've given you three three previous lectures where we talked about all the decisions you have to make as you compare that person. And um, you know it it uh, it brings us to 
clinical trials. Um, I make most of my living doing clinical trials. I'm a researcher, is my main job, and I, I participate in clinical trial networks. Um, and I've um, helped with several dozen clinical trials, almost all of which showed no difference between groups. So the usual result of a clinical trial is no difference. And this bothers me because it's no fun. You work really hard and you discover nah, that doesn't work. And um, you know, I really wish I had some things to do. So you know, we make these things, we discover what was better sequential. And the, the goal of clinical trials is to say, you know, did an intervention make things better or did it make things worse? Um, we try to get you know reasonable outcomes that are not a burden on the patient. We use a strategy that has been around for hundreds of years. Uh, we randomly assign people to one strategy versus another strategy. We hopefully measure whether the strategy is doing something. You know, so if there's a blood marker or a PEG marker or something, we'd like to see, you know, did we actually deliver the therapy we thought we were going to deliver? And look, you know, did it make them better? Uh, did it make them worse? <clears throat> so, you know, it's really counting the outcomes. This is the traditional model for um, clinical trials, again, for hundreds of years. And um, it's uh, the gold standard for medical research. This is what we all look for. Is there a randomized controlled trial that has um, shown benefit for, for some intervention? <clears throat> what outcome you know, should we use um, with these cardiac arrest patients? What do you think? Patients care about what is reasonable, what is easy, what is your favorite? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, that's correct. Yeah, I'm yeah. asking. Yeah, I'm because it's just to understand. I didn't know you get the best of that. <clears throat> who, who thinks live, live dead? Sure, I'm not sure. Five days is good. Um, you know, anxiety. How do I measure anxiety in the person who died? <laughs> Maybe we have maximum anxiety because they're dead. Like, you know, all the things are anxiety. You know, um, you know, the functional sort, the modified brain. Again, remember, I like that because it has pictures. I can understand the pictures. And it has a lot of literature, so I can compare it to stroke trials and traumatic brain injury trials. Um, you know, but the patient's number one complaint is fatigue. So, all of in, in, in when do I measure it? You know, do I measure it three months, six months, 12 months? Well, if I measure it at 12 months, do I, do I consider it different than patients who went to rehab from patients who did not go to rehab? Because maybe rehab made a difference in how they looked at 12 months, even though they were the same at three months. Um, it's, um, it's their traditional design. And we analyze it the way we have analyzed it for 100 years. We assume there's no difference between groups. We assume that you know, the groups will be equal. And then if we detect a difference, we say that one is better. And we use statistics to decide in advance how big of a difference is going to be significant. Um, by a thousand patients, maybe you know 5% is different. And that's Great. And if they only have 100 patients, maybe I need 2% to be different. So that's no hypothesis statistical testing. It's the, it's the, way, to, it's the way that we usually do things. Um, and that will be familiar to you from all of your education. And it will be what we talk about on rounds to say, is there a clinical trial showing that this therapy that, um, that uh, you know, Dr. Roman is proposing, this crazy therapy, is shown to be better than not? Um, so I have a story. I received a patient after cardiac arrest, and they had a cardiac arrest in their hospital. It was um, uh, complicated because they were in the hospital with some kind of uh, uh, cirrhosis. I think they had been admitted with large ascites, and they had some respiratory event. The details were not clear, but they came in and they, they had albumin running. So the patient was being resuscitated with fluid, and the fluid resuscitation was albumin. I'm thinking, I don't usually see cardiac arrest patients being resuscitated with albumin. And I thought, that's kind of crazy. 
And I thought, maybe it's not crazy. Maybe albumin is, is, is appropriate for, for this. And I, I look, you know, like we always do, to see is there a clinical trial? You know, I mean, the theory would be um, this person had um, some kind of vascular permeability problem. And uh, after, their, after their insult, um, you know, there's more inflammation, more leaky fluid. If I give crystalloid, it's just going to leak out of all the vessels and go everywhere. If I get colloid, albumin, it's going to stay inside. It's more likely to stay inside. It'll be a better resuscitation to it. So, you know, is there a trial? <clears throat> and is the trial going to be the, the, the traditional kind of trial that I'm looking for? Some people get treatment A, restored, treatment B, albumin, and, you know, do they have a better outcome? Which is cardiac arrest patient, it's also a liver patient. Um, ideally, I'm going to randomize them. And I looked and turned out there were trials. Impacted albumin compared to saline and organ function mortality of patients with severe sepsis. In my patient, um, you know, had this ascites and the respiratory event that you know, the, the doctors there thought they were septic. You know, they thought they had bacterial peritonitis and that this was part of their demise. And that's how they became my patient. So this trial took 1,200 patients, gave half of them albumin, gave half of them saline by random, and they looked at the percentage who died. So, you know, like for live dad, yeah, you had, you had voted for live dad as not on big agree. And um, <clears throat> they got these results. 30.7% in one group died, and 35.3% in the saline group died. So, on rounds, when you ask, you know, what's the what's the p value? Right? Is it significant? Is that difference chance or is that significant? Um, and uh, it's not. You know, the p value is four point six percent. You had a p. You can express it as odds ratio, or risk ratio, or just different ways of showing the same data. Four point six percent different. P value is 0.09. So what do you decide on rounds? Is this therapy proven? Not proven. Albumin's no better. How many people think albumin's better? See how better? No difference. Okay, no difference. Okay, very good. So Thirty point seven percent and thirty five point three percent die. 0.09. Albumin does not improve mortality in severe sepsis. P value of 0.09. These are all things we say. You read this on Twitter, which is now called X. And so you conclude albumin does not improve mortality in severe sepsis. And <clears throat> to break my heart, you say this is a failed trial or a negative trial. So the clinical trials, you know, I get depression, I get anxiety, because mm -hmm. you know, call my trial, you know, a failed trial. Um, I prefer much that you call it a neutral trial, where the groups are not different. Um, it's a much less um, uh, threatening um, way to describe the trial. And, you know, I want you to think about the p-value for a moment. Um, our null hypothesis testing had this idea that the real real thing was that there's no difference between albumin and saline. And we got a difference of around 5, 5%. And that p-value is telling me how likely it is that that result happened if the real world is that there's no difference between them. So p-values do not measure effect size. If they are telling me is the probability of getting that effect that there's really no difference. But I did this experiment, or these investigators did this experiment, and what they found was that there's a 4.6% difference between saline and albumin. And they have a confidence interval on it. And, you know, if they had done a bigger sample with a larger trial, and they had the same difference, it would be highly significant. Same, same percentages, 
but with more people is very significant. And this is here to remind you the p value doesn't say anything about 4%. It's a function of 4% in the number of patients in the trials. So there, there could be a 4% difference between groups or 0% difference. And I just didn't have enough patients to, to hone in on which one it is. Could be either one. I do have a confidence interval though. Um, I'm 95% sure that the difference is not negative 20%. And that it's also not plus 5%. So I've excluded that sailing is much better than albumin. I have not excluded that sailing is 5% better. And I've probably excluded with confidence that sailing is 15% better. So this confidence interval is a better way to talk about my effect size. Let's go a little bit quickly through this. You know, if I get a bigger sample size, my estimate of the null hypothesis gets tighter. And so that same effect becomes significant uh, just because my numbers are bigger, my number of observations. And the real observed effect is in fact the best estimate of the difference between these groups. I say that albumin does not improve mortality in severe sepsis. Mathematically, that's the same as saying that 30.7 is not less than 35.3. Or if I say saline is better than albumin, then I'm saying 35.3 is not more than 30.7. If I'm saying albumin is not worse than saline, it's saying that negative 4.6 is less than zero. That's true. Albumin and saline are equivalent. The same as our risk ratio for 0.87 is one. So, you know, those statements that because I did not detect an effect, that there is no effect, that's not the way it works. Not detecting an effect means I did not detect it. I did not confirm it. That does not mean that there is none. And my best estimate of what effect there is, is the effect I observed. When I started, I had no idea. I thought, okay, let's assume they're equal. But now that I've collected data, I'm smarter. And so now, if you ask me, well, what's the likely difference between them? I'd say the most likely difference is 5%. The last thousand patients we looked at, the difference between the groups is about 5%. So what difference did you really observe? How big was the sample? Don't ask, is it significant? How big was the sample? What difference did you observe? Let's try this in another trial, just for, um, for uh, generalizability. This is the therapeutic hypothermia trial in children, out of hospital cardiac arrest in children. If I took um, this trial, it had 300 kids and they randomly assigned them to get hypothermia or monothermia, and you look to see who had survival with good neurological outcome. We used a pediatric scale, it's like my other a pediatric scale. And, um, you know, they did 33 degrees or monothermia. This survival group. 38% um, of the kids with hypothermia survived the good outcome, and 20% of the kids with normal thermia survived the good outcome. I've misstated that 38% versus 29%, and the neurological outcome 20% versus 12%. And you see the p values 0.13 and 0.14. So these. Um, so these data with those key values are usually summarized as the fact the trial showed no difference between um, treatment groups. So look at the curves. Um, which curve do you want your kid to be on? What's the likely, what's the most likely difference between groups? Um, Survival, 38% versus 39%, 9% difference in survival is the most likely um, outcome. So um, if you look at their sample size calculation, the power to detect an absolute effect size of 15 to 20%. And what we observed was a difference of 7.3% with those confidence intervals. And if you analyze the data this way, 
you can look at those confidence intervals and say, look, this trial pretty much excluded the possibility that hypothermia is worse for kids than normal thermia. It excluded a 20% improvement, which is what they were powered to detect. Um, but it really doesn't exclude a 10% improvement or a 15% improvement. And that's what we know. Because can you really do a big trial and not learn anything and just say two things are the same? It really, it's really hard to show that two things are identical. You did a trial and the groups often have some difference and you, you learn something from doing the trial. Bayesian analysis is one way to look at that. Um, you know, we started with what we know, we get some data and we update what we know. Um, you'll see these kinds of reanalyses of these trials to present the data in the way that I'm presenting it to you. Um, as you begin the trial, you say, I have no idea, so the null hypothesis is a good starting point. I'll say that the difference between groups is zero. But after I do the trial, my best guess is based on the results. I just showed you where it goes, you know, I said 5% is the difference between my albumin and CRM. Uh, and if I put it on a curve, I can say, well, what's the difference? What's the, what's the percentage of my estimate it's greater than zero. How likely is it that albumin is better than saline? And it's really what's under the blue and under the curve in blue uh, when you do this kind of Bayesian reanalysis. Um, how likely is it that the treatment is better than the control? Another cardiac arrest example in trials. Um, I'm honest. Another one of the trials I did that doesn't show a difference. And the other one might have placebo for cardiac arrest. So we took patients who were in ventricular fibrillation and we randomly assigned them to get an antihistrytic. And the, the paramedics gave a vial that was either placebo, and the other one, or lidocaine. We had almost 3,000 patients. We, um, Randomly allocated them. The, the vials were randomly given to the paramedics, and we looked to see who was alive and how to discharge. We estimated that with 3,000 people, we could detect a difference of 6.3% between groups. And we're going to compare the drug groups to placebo. So we were going to be powered for a 6.3 percentage point difference. And what we got was this 24%. 24%, 21%. P values you see here for 0.16. Um, and so this is a neutral trial. So in ventricular fibrillation cardiac arrest, when we don't respond to a shock, how many people give any odor? Yeah, yeah, half the people admit to it, the other people are kind of embarrassed by it. Um, you know, it's common. We, we get any error. Um, are these numbers identical? Is 24 equal to 23.7 equal to 21? They're not equal, right? Um, so there is some difference observed, but am I sure that that difference is real or could it be chance? I don't know. It could be both. But p values don't tell me is there a difference. The difference tells me zero difference. If I do this as a Bayesian reanalysis, when we did this, and I present the data to you in that other way where I talk about the difference we observe, you can look at the odd ratios or the mean difference, and then look at the blue part of the curve. You can do different assumptions to make those curves. And then you can say, well, in the other end, might have been, are 80 to 90% more likely beneficial than saline. It's not 95% certain, it's 80% certain that giving one of those drugs is more beneficial than, uh, than giving uh, saline. So that's um, you know, the way that the absolute difference um, can be used. And, on rounds, 
Um, my, a shape when we say anterior and lidocaine were not superior to placebo, focusing only on the p value. And I think it's more precise that in a trial, that when we powered you did big enough to detect a 6% difference, we observed a 3% difference. And the confidence interval on the, on the 3% is from negative 0.4 to 7. So the real value is probably in that range. Uh, Y came 2.2% relative to placebo. Both of them have more than 80% likelihood of being better than placebo. And that makes me feel like with 3,000 patients, I know more than before we did the trial. Kind of get the, the feel for how you should look at a trial more critically and learn something from it, even if you can't prove that something is superior uh, based on the p-value. So hopefully you're going to forget about p-values and look at the data. Um, what difference did you observe? How big was the sample? Do I care about the insertion? Really for the future. Uh, real patients go have real doctors. And this messing around with trials has made me worry about a thing I call critical care bias. And we all try to make our patients do better. So if you consider that experiment again, where we randomize the patient to albumin uh, or saline, and we look to see if it raises blood pressure. Um, that's wonderful if that was the end of the story. But in the patient who doesn't have their blood pressure improved, what do we do in reality? Um, anything we can. If our initial resuscitation isn't working, we come and resuscitate the patient more. Um, if they're not doing well after a few days, we do more therapy. So in reality, the treating team comes along and does aggressive clinical care. And so maybe the person does well. So this is something that I think makes our world different from the 100-year history of randomized control trials. Classic randomized trial is that I get a doctor's office. You come to me with a condition and I give you antibiotic or placebo, and then I call you up and you can say, did you get better? No other interventions. In the intensive care unit, you do something, maybe it's randomized. An hour later, the patient's not doing good, you do something else. An hour later, you do something else. You continue to do that for a month <laughs> or, or until, until you have one of these outcomes. Always trying to achieve this. So it's not the random things that you do. You're doing them intentionally to reduce the difference between those groups. So, you know, I, I presented the data in the last two lectures about how if patients look bad, in my country, the doctor says, this patient looks bad, maybe we should stop supporting them. People with all life support and then they die. So they were correct. The patient who looked at it will die. But the pathway that causes that is not because they looked at it, it's because the doctor and the family went through life sustaining treatment. Um, I showed you this trial as evidence that that's not random. So this one, uh, the Telstar trial, took patients after cardiac arrest with rhythmic and periodic EEGs, treated them with seizure medicines or control looked at their outcomes, but here's their withdrawal of life support. Rather than the people getting the intervention, and they tended to get withdrawal of life support treatment on day five. Patients who were being placebo didn't have withdrawal of life support treatment on day two. And clearly there's an interaction between the intervention and what doctors perceived and what they acted upon uh, after the procedure. So this is really how this trial runs. This is the addition. We have, we have out, now we're right, thank you. And we have outcomes in between. And uh, you know, there might be a decision to withdraw life support, and that will determine the outcome. 
And then, you know, the outcomes that we might choose that are more patient-centered um, are all contingent on those intermediate steps. And that makes me really concerned because of um, a whole field of statistics, which I'm going to call um, probability reversal. And it's a whole citation where, you know, if they're looking at treatments and whether they cause improvement, we do the analysis. This is just not letters for all the numbers we've been looking at. And we put it in those two by two tables and look, you know, we gave a treatment, how many people improved, how many worsened, what's the percent of treatment. We give control, how many people improved, how many worsened, what's the improvement. And we look at the difference between them. In this case, 0%. So here's two, two things where it's identical. But, but what if my group's made up of men? And in men, 62% improved the treatment, 57% improved the control, the difference is 5%. So in women, it must be the opposite. 44% improved with treatment, 40% improved with control. It's not different, actually, 4% of men improved, 5% of men improved, 4% improvement in women. But overall, there's no difference. Look at those numbers for a moment. Make sure I'm not doing sleight of hand. Those numbers all really add up. So you can have subgroups where there's benefit, but when you put the groups together, there's no benefit. And this um, goes by the name, this famous statistical trick, or whatever, symptoms paradox. Um, the treatment is 5% better to control if you're male, it's 4% better to control if you're female, but it has no effect if you do not know the gene. So it's absurd, right? But how can this be? Um, it's because the treatment is not equally allocated between groups. Um, in men, 60% improve. In women, 44% improve. But the treatment, you know, which is 60%, you know, sex is associated with improvement uh, that way. And the treatment is given to 65% of men and 84% of women. So gender affects whether treatment is given. And it makes this triangle of causality, you know, where, where gender is affecting both the treatment and it's affecting the improvement. And, um, you know, now um, in the world of causal inference, um, they talk about this as a confounder and they talk about it as a backdoor um, pathway where you have two ways that the treatment is connected with improvement directly and also through this confounder. Okay, confounders are no big deal. You remember those from basic statistics. If there's a confounder, you have to control for it. You need to do some statistical adjustment to adjust for the confounder. So I adjust for sex and look for the treatment effect. And I can, you know, read this out. And, you know, I think that this actually gives me a complete picture of what's going on there. The treatment is 5% improvement in both groups, but the confounder causes me to be 20% less likely to get the treatment. And the confounder also causes me to be 16% more likely to improve. I have to add all those things together to get the total summative effect, but I understand you know, what each one is. Whew, that's not a clinical trial, though. That's kind of an observation story of confounders. Clinical trial is where we do something. We give a treatment, we look for improvement. Let's imagine like giving a beta blocker or VTAC. Well, you know, beta blockers also can cause cardiogenic shock. And uh, that might affect whether I improve or not. And if I put similar kinds of numbers into it, right, take 80 people or treat 40 with um, beta blockers, 40 to get control, I get with cardiogenic shock. <coughs> some people get cardiogenic shock. And 46% improve. Um, 43% of controls, the difference is 3%. If I don't get cardiogenic shock, also 3% difference between treatments and controls. You can see you do worse if you have cardiogenic shock. But if you put them together, overall no difference. It's the same triangle of causality because more people are treated 
you get cardiogenic shock. People who are treated get more cardiogenic shock. Cardiogenic shock, the treatment, causes a 30% increase in getting cardiogenic shock. And if I have cardiogenic shock, I'm less likely to improve, even though I improve more if I'm being treated. Getting cardiogenic shock knocks my treatment down, my improvement down by 10%. And I get that triangle. The Simpsons paradox or the backdoor path for a trial. So this is a clinical trial now, which is supposed to be bulletproof to this kind of thing. Um, we don't call it a confounder. What would you call cardiogenic shock in this? What? It might be an Italian name for it. An effect you don't want. Event. An adverse event, yeah. Or side effect, yeah. You know, so I'm giving the drug to improve my disease, but it has this adverse effect which worsens my disease. And I can miss, you know, the biological effects if I um, don't really look at this whole triangle and understand how it's being mediated. So, I think that the right way to look at this is to know all three of those numbers, 30%, 10%, 3%. 3%. When I have all of those, I understand the relative um, impact of this intervention on, on what I'm doing. If I just look at the p-value, then this was a neutral trial. This trial told me that beta blockers are not different than placebo. But they're clearly not inert. They do something, um, but they do more than one thing. And the more than one thing is added up to nothing. But if I do the trial and I know all of these numbers, then I actually know a, a lot more than if I had never done the trial. So treatment's 3% better if I develop shock, better if I do not develop shock. It increases the risk of shock to 30%, and developing shock is 2% worse than not developing shock. What would you do now that you know all those numbers? Um, you know, is there any way to make beta blockers beneficial, knowing that this is this is going on? Maybe it's like a patient that has less probability to develop a Perfect. Find a subgroup. Find out, figure out who gets cardiogenic shock after I get beta one. Don't get it to them. And then maybe uh, beta blocker is going to be three percent beneficial in the other people you now because I've eliminated this stuff, this side effect, this adverse effect. Um, another thing is to anticipate the cardiogenic shock and then make a better beta blocker that doesn't cause that, or to redesign the drug, or to you know only use it when I have cardio cardiac support in place. Um, you know, I mean. That's how you know more after the trial than just saying, oh, the p value is greater than 0.05, and so it's a neutral trial. I can forget about this whole topic. Um, that is learning, you know, from the biology of all three numbers. So, you know, where are we going to go forward with this? This is my, this is the uh, ambulance that my hospital emergency department um, place, which is now under construction because we're building a new tower. So this is, Going to be the old ambulance. So you have the same kind of construction that you have here for the new children's tower um, going on outside of our emergency department. Um, I just described uh, a trial. But look, my cardiac arrest cartoon, where withdrawal of life sustained treatment, it has that same triangle. So when I make sort of the causal, causal mechanism, um, you can see that the exam in the ICU is causing withdrawal of life sustaining treatment and affecting whether I survive. That's just like the symptoms paradox. It's just like the beta blocker example. The mathematics are the same. And, you know, rehab, you know, maybe, maybe how I look at hospital discharge affects whether I go to rehab, and maybe that affects my long term outcome. Uh, 
So I have two triangles. In fact, I, I know data about rehab. I know that in my hospital, um, if you have a modified rehab of four, they also discharge you most likely to be referred to acute rehab. And you know, you become more likely to go home if you have modified records of zero or one and lower uh, MRIs of five and so forth in the other facilities. So there's kind of a U-shaped curve for you refer to rehab. And you can actually sort of take this diagram and and um, you know talk about these intermediate mediators of, of outcome. This is just two examples. We draw the life sustaining treatment and rehab, but what about your fluid choice and your pressure choice and whether you went to angiography and whether you did um, uh, 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 digestive tract decontamination? All of those are decisions that happen in their intermediate mediators of outcome. And the longer I wait to measure my outcome, the more of those decisions I make between now and then. Um, the better medical teams interact with the patients, more and more mediators happen. I fix this by preventing you from making any decisions. If I did a clinical trial, and I said you're going to randomize the patient to amiodarone or lidocaine, and then you're not allowed to withdraw life support, you're not allowed to adjust the basic pressures, you're not allowed to choose angiography, everybody goes to angiography. Um, it's just not practical. I could not let you, you know, it may not be ethical to even, you know, give you that kind of thing. But that's what we do in animal studies. You know, in animal studies, we detect these effects and we go, oh, it didn't work in the clinical trial. How come it didn't work in the clinical trial? This is very impractical to prevent all this. Maybe better is to try to measure all this, which means lots of math. I have to look at the incidents of each of these things, and I have to figure out the association with each of these things, and uh, I have to sort through them. I, I presented you on some slides that you actually know some of these things, right? So I showed you an inverted U-shaped curve that we have. If I withdraw life support, it produces outcomes by 100%, so it reduces survival to zero. And um, I showed you that there's about a 60% incidence of withdrawal of life support in the in the cardiac arrest clinical trials that I've, that I've presented to you from North America and Europe. So um, I'm not aware of any clinical trial where we calculated all of these things. And this is the part where I said, I'm not gonna be able to give you an answer, but I, I want you to understand the problem and why we constantly pick up the journal looking for the clinical trial and critical care that shows us a great effect. And we see, oh, another neutral trial, another neutral trial, another neutral trial. Even for things that with your own hands, you give it to the patient, and the patient gets better in front of you. But when we do it in a randomized trial, we get more effect. Hopefully that bothers you, because it bothers me a great deal. Um, and then, you know, which ones do you care about? So if we're trying to learn from the biology and like how to tune things up, I want to know, you know, what is the direct effect of this intervention? Because maybe I can find subsets of patients where I don't get the side effect or where I can mitigate the side effect by anticipating it and making it go away. Or use a cocktail of problems. So I'm going to sum up here. Aggressive clinical care. If my treatment effect between groups is less than what I can do by giving aggressive clinical care, I can probably count on the clinical trial being neutral. So if I'm able to overcome the effect of drug A versus drug B by using other tricks, then I probably will never detect it. I probably am going to detect stuff that kills you. Because if you have a rapidly lethal intervention, uh, that'll show up, and I'm not going to be able to do that. And if I have very, very powerful interventions, you know, antibiotics versus no antibiotics for infection, um, I'll probably be able to detect that. Everything else, I think, is a high risk of these neutral trials. I think we need to be measuring all these pathways. Um, I think that we don't do this because that looks like a lot of math. It looks very statistical, uh, and it looks really hard. Um, there's a push to do pragmatic trials where we have a low budget, 
And we just change one thing and we look to see, you know, in the medical record how the patient did, and we don't measure a lot of stuff. Um, to me, that means a un underpowered, you know, kind of half assed trial. So I hate pragmatic trials because you don't make the effort to figure out what's really going on. And I think that in critical care, we have really, really high risk of having, I don't know how many of these triangles, 20 triangles, 40 triangles. There's so many decisions you make in the intensive care unit that it makes it different in that trial where you come to my office and I'm prescribing antibiotic A and antibiotic B and I call you up and you know, we're not working in that space. So many things influence patient outcomes. Patients are interested in longer term outcomes, but that increases the risk of critical care bias and it increases the risk of these neutral trials. I don't want you to rely on p-values. I want you to look at the effects that people really observe. And then I really want you to think about that critical care confounder and look if we can, when you see a trial, can you untangle, is that at play? And, you know, can we, can we pretty flesh on that um, complicated diagram so that we understand those triangles and, uh, and, uh, be able to learn something from the trial and move forward as opposed to saying, nope, that's just something that doesn't work. It's the first way, the p-value way, just leads to nihilism, where we say nothing works and it doesn't matter if they're work or not. Um, it'll, be a, it'll be an easy day, um, but um, lots of neutral trials suggest that uh, it really doesn't matter. I think, I'm, I think I'm at the end there, and there was a lot of math. So my wife would complain and said, you gave too much math. <laughs> Hopefully that'll make you think a little bit about, about neutral trials and make you suspicious of p-values and make you want to look at effect sizes and decide, you know, what's the future going to show, not, not just that nothing works. Um, this is the big uh, power of the university. Um, you can see the hospital with Judah uh, in purple there with a little flag and um, the uh, park that I showed you at the very beginning here at night. Come to Pittsburgh if you have a chance. Um, I recommend you come in the fall or spring. The winter is a little, a little risk, um, but uh, we'd like to have a bigger exchange between our campuses. And I, I really want to thank everyone for being polite and listening to me. Um, it's uh, been fun to talk for uh, a sequence of lectures. And, Hopefully, we give you a, a flavor of how we think about things and uh, give you some things to think about. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.